the gospel according to John, chapter 20. And as you know, we do read from the authorized King James Version. Um, no reflection on the other versions, but we use them mostly for study, but in our worship setting, we all try to be with one accord in reading the uh, old King James, not new King James. And if you have that, I want you to read with me John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. And um, we'll go through verse 23. You have that say amen? amen? Come on, let's read it aloud together. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. We'll stop at this point. I want you to pay particular attention to uh, what the Lord said uh, to them uh, in verse 21. Well, verse 22, and when he had said this, he <sighs> breathed on them and saith unto them, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Uh, I know it's only been a short time ago, just a few weeks when I spoke from this subject, but I've got to go back to it again. I want to say to every one of you, receive ye the Holy Ghost. God bless you, ushers. I am totally convinced that as a body of believers, that we will never be the people whom God would have us to be until we are not only people believing in Jesus Christ, but we must also be believers who are filled with the Holy Ghost. It's what makes the difference. There are a lot of people who are alive as you go through some of the nursing homes and some hospital rooms and even in some homes. You have people that are yet alive but they themselves hardly know they are alive. They're just lying there. Some because of uh, Alzheimer's, mentally they are no longer competent. Sometimes because of debilitating physical diseases, they are there and they are not able to move, but they are alive. Why am I saying this? I'm not going to tell you that if you have embraced Jesus as Lord and Savior, 
You have believed on him. You have confessed him. And according to Romans chapter 10, once you believe and confess, that's what brings about salvation. But there are people who have believed and confessed and now they have eternal life, but they hardly know they have it. They have no joy. They're not able to go through their problems, difficulties of life, everything that happens. They get all uh, messed up and start pushing the panic button. But the Lord does not want you just to be alive. He says in Romans 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that that life might be what? More abundantly. He wants you to live the abundant life. And that abundant life does not just consist of being a prosperous Christian as it relates to materialism. But he wants you to have an abundant spiritual experience. And I've said it so many times that if you are a believer in Christ, you are living beneath your privilege if you do not have the Holy Ghost. But again, I say, as I've said many times before, God is not going to overpower you and force the Holy Ghost upon you. He's not going to do you like I told you my mother used to do me. If I coughed or sneeze and she grabbed that castor oil bottle, there was nothing I could say that would stop her from forcing me to take that stuff. But the Lord is not going to force you to receive the Holy Ghost. He says, blessed are they that do what? Hunger and thirst after righteousness. They shall be filled. You, you got to get hungry for the things of God. Oh yes, oh yes. You got to have something down inside of you that even when you get through coming on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock and listening to the choir and the orchestra and listening to the word and getting out there in the aisles and cutting a few steps uh, that you don't feel I'm fulfilled until next Sunday something down inside of you hallelujah that even when you get home let, let, let me get back in this scripture let, let me read let me let me read this again my god that was so good i just got to have some more glory to god and and, and you get down on your knees and pray and you may used to be contented after a minute and a half but you find i gotta stay here and talk to him a little bit longer when, when god begins to Put a stirring in your spirit. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst. Hallelujah. I believe that if I keep talking to you about this missing element that is in the life of so many believers, if I can stir you up until you develop an appetite when I was coming along as a youngster and they, they stressed it. Yes, you're saved, but you've got to have the Holy Ghost. And we'd have long revivals, sometimes two and three weeks. I remember one that I conducted right here at the other building that lasted something like the better part of three months. When you really get hungry, oh, glory to God, you can be ever so tired voice may be so hoarse you can hardly talk but you just want to get in the company of people that are calling on Jesus and there's something about it when you really get hungry the world doesn't have much to offer you then doesn't matter who they tell you is performing at the casino I don't care who's performing at the casino I know Jesus is performing down at the church 
I know all I got to do is get with one or two saints. And whatever I need is there to quench my thirst. Jesus, in today's text, had just come out of the grave that day. Now, if you don't believe it, just look back to verse 1 of chapter 20. It says, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. And it goes on to talk about what happened. And you can read straight on through until you get to verse 19. And it says, then the same day at evening and there's not a, a, a flipping of the calendar anywhere between verse 1 and verse 19 the only thing is it starts off the morning of his resurrection but later on that same evening his disciples were behind closed doors for fear scared of what the Jews were going to do yes they've killed our Lord and, and uh, buried him and and those brothers never did get it down in their spirit that he was alive. But while they were meeting behind closed doors, all of a sudden, he stepped in. And you can say what you want to. You can close the door. The enemy can lock the door. But if somebody in there start talking about Jesus, he'll step in. I don't care what kind of situation you are in. You start talking about Jesus, he'll step in. It doesn't matter what it is, he'll step into your marriage. You think it's over, but he'll step in and bring that thing back together. He'll step into your mental condition. Hallelujah, when you find that you're not thinking like you ought to. And while others are saying, yes, they, they, they've hit that early senility, they've gone into that early Alzheimer's, but I'm here to tell you that if you can refocus your mind, he said, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Touch somebody and tell him he'll step into any situation. Hallelujah. While they were behind closed doors for fear, Jesus stepped into their midst. And the words that he said is, peace be unto you. What a day. What a day of confusion. What a day of frustration. The world seemingly is more confused now than it has ever been. Everybody is talking about I'm under stress. Everybody is stressed out. Problems everywhere. Now that the communication highway is open and everything now is revolving around the, the internet, the world wide web. And now they discovered somebody in China that jammed up the web and uh, pirated so many people's names and credit card numbers. And you, you just don't, everything is confused. Jesus told us from the beginning in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have confusion. But he said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Yeah, you live on the world, the ram, you're going to live in confusion. But if you want power over this confused world, you got to hear Jesus speaking in your spirit, saying, peace, glory to God, like he did with the troubled waters. The water was dashing in the boat. Peter and the disciples got upset. But when they woke up Jesus, he stood up looked out at the wind and said peace down at the waters be still wind stopped blowing and the troubled waters stopped jumping in the boat i don't care what the confusion is that's in your life i declare he can say peace and when he said peace everything has to be still oh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can't you hear him now telling you, speaking to your situation? No, see, he doesn't compete for attention. 
when the prophet Elijah needed to talk to him, <laughs> he thought surely he was in the storm. Surely he was in the whirlwind. Surely he was in all of the noisy stuff. But when God finally spoke, he just whispered in a still, small voice. You upset about something? Quit trying to hear God competing. You just get somewhere and steady yourself. I declare in the quietitude. And the peace of your mind. He'll say, peace. Be still. Sit down, y'all. ain't ready to go that way. Now when he said peace. He said, I want, I want to show you something so you'll have no mistake of who I am. He showed him his hand and his side. In other words, so you'll know I'm the same one that's been keeping company with you the last three and a half years. Look at my hands and look at my side. And that's why I don't even worry about all of these false messiahs. Because when he comes back, right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But when he comes back, won't nobody have to introduce me to him? Won't nobody have to tell me I got to buy, buy an airline ticket to go over to Egypt or go to Jerusalem or anywhere else? Said when he comes, it's going to be like the lightning streaking across the sky. You're going to know he's here. And when he stops in midair, and the magnetism of his presence will cause graves to burst open. Then we which are alive and remain will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. And I won't have to ask Peter to introduce me to him. I shall know him. As redeemed by his side, I'll stand. I'm going to know him because even when he come back, He's going to still have the prints of the nails in his hand. When he said peace, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And then he did something that, even when I first started as a teenage preacher, I found hard to understand. He didn't just tell them, Now you fellas go back to the upper room and, and get the Holy Ghost. But he, <laughs> he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. That thing troubled me for years. Why, why, why would he breathe on them? In John chapter 14, 15, and 16, he had talked to them about what the Holy Ghost would do, that it would bring all things back to their remembrance, that he would be that guide, that he would be that teacher, that he would testify of Jesus Christ. But yet he breathed on them. And I later understood that the breathing on them was symbolic. Now much of what takes place in Christianity is symbolic. Next Sunday right here at the 11 o'clock hour we'll again share our Lord's body and blood in Holy Communion. Yes, we refer to the unleavened bread as the Lord's broken body. But you know, in reality, it's not his body. It's a symbol of his body. We'll drink from that uh, cup of non-fermented grapes. <laughs> and 
and we refer to that as his blood. But you know, literally speaking, that is not his blood. It is symbolic. Even when the baptism takes place. Yes, behind those drapes there, the baptismal pool. And when the people will go into the water to be baptized, it's symbolic. It's a symbol of the fact that no longer am I my own. Now, since I have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'm crucified with Christ. And because I'm crucified and because I have uh, mortified the members of the flesh, I'm dead to sin. So anything dead is to be buried. So you are buried in the watery grave. But because we also believe in the resurrection, we don't take folk under and leave them under, but we lift them back up signifying the fact that I'm risen to the newness of life and also meaning that when I do die physically the grave won't hold me I'm going to come back up just like my Lord did so much in Christianity is symbolic so he he breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And there's something about it. The breath of the Lord. That's really what I'm trying to get over to you. The breath of the Lord. When he breathed on them. That's power in the breath of the Lord. If you don't believe it, go back to the book of beginnings. Go back to Genesis. God, after he had created everything in the first five days, on the sixth day, he made man. I never will forget my dad, the late Bishop W.A. Patterson, used to say uh, that God made man on the sixth day, last if he'd made him earlier, man would have probably been standing around trying to tell God how to make everything else. So he put everything else in the earth first. Then on the sixth day, he made man. How? He formed him from the dust of the ground. Formed him. The torso, the legs, the arms. The head shaped him in his own image. There a man stands like a department store mannequin. Everything in place, but he didn't have any life. Formed and he had hands, had a head, had feet. Everything perfectly formed, but there was no life until God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and then man became a living soul. Don't underestimate the power of his breath. Follow me to Ezekiel. You know the story in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel? Story goes that two armies had collided together in battle. Each side had so many casualties. But all of a sudden, for some reason, they quickly retreated. Didn't take the time to bury their dead. Thousands are lying in the open valley. The buzzards had picked the flesh. Jackals walking through had scattered the bones. Bones lying in the sun had become bleached, parched, and brittle. And God said to the prophet Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? I want you to take a close look. 
Then I want you to compass the valley round and about. Then go down and closely observe. What is your version? Can they live? Ezekiel said, God, I don't know, but you know. You know whether they can live. And if they'll the recover, you've got to tell me what to do. And God said, son of man, prophesy. Preach to these bones. And sell all oh, ye dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Prophet stood with his back in the south and he looked north and said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. After a while, bones began to come together. Oh, hallelujah. You know, they said, in the, toe bone connected to the foot bone and the foot bone to the ankle bone and the ankle bone to the leg bone, the leg bone to the knee bone, the knee bone to the thigh bone and come on up and it connected with, with the spine and on up th till it connected with the head bone and the shoulder bone and everything got together. And whenever the church gets out of order, God made you to be a uh, little joint of the little finger. And you laying up there by the skull trying to be the head. All you got to do is hear the word of the Lord and everybody will get back in their own place. But even after the bones got together, they were still dead. God commanded that sinew and that skin would come and cover the bones, yes. but they were still dead. Yes. Then the Lord said, well, I tell you what you need to do now, preach to the wind. Yes. And he stood in the north and looked south and called for the south wind. Yes. Stood in the south and looked north and called for the north wind. Yes. Stood in the east and looked west and called for the west wind. Yes. Stood in the west and looked east and call for the east wind and I hear him say to the wind blow upon these bones that they might live and even though the bones were standing up they didn't have no life until the wind began to blow the Lord told his disciples now I've already given you my word I've already given you power against unclean spirits. I've already given you power to cast demons and devils out. But I want you to have witnessing power. I want you to have power that'll be stability power. I want you now to go back to the upper room and receive ye the Holy Ghost. If he hadn't breathed on them, they really would not have known when the Holy Ghost arrived because the baptismal measure of the Holy Ghost had never been given. True prophets, holy men, speak as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. True that Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost when the unborn Jesus met the unborn John the Baptist. Yes. True John yes, was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb, yes. but the baptismal measure had not been given. Yes. If you don't believe it, look at John chapter seven, yes. down around verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, yes. Jesus stood and cried saying, Anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. Yes. Hallelujah. And he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit. In other words, when he talked about living water, he wasn't talking about formula H2O but he was talking about the spirit which they that believed on him would receive at a later date. 
So since the baptismal measure had never come, the disciples didn't know what they were looking for. So they went into the upper room and in chapter one of Acts, they held an election to elect Matthias who would take the place of Judas. But even though they held an election, the Holy Ghost didn't come. Hallelujah. 10 days later, feel my help now. While they were sitting, blessing and praising God. Wasn't nobody at the altar kneeling. Wasn't nobody patting over nobody else saying, thank you, Jesus. But they were just sitting in the temple, sitting rather in the upper room. And all of a sudden, there came a sign from heaven like the rushing of a mighty wind and there appeared unto them cloven tongues that sat upon them and they began to speak with other tongues but what they heard was they heard the wind and when they heard the wind their mind triggered them back to Jesus because Jesus said Holy Ghost Receive the Holy Ghost. And when the wind start blowing, when the wind start whistling around their head, they knew that this was the Holy Ghost. And I'm going to my seat, but my prayer is, God send another Pentecost. Send it, let the wind blow fresh from heaven. Send it, let your people be slain in the spirit. Send it, I don't know about you, but I hear the wind blowing again. Oh, the wind. He come to Lomosha, hallelujah. I hear it in the air. Jesus wants his church to be filled, baptized with the Holy Ghost. Time out for playing. You need something that's real. Oh, it's real. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, we need you to come in this place like you did at Pentecost. Shake us again. Anoint us again. Fill us again. Baptize us again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can't make it without you. We need We need your spirit. We need the anointing of your power. We need your glory to be revealed in us. Oh, fill us again. Come on, tell him, fill us. Fill us. Fill us. Come on and praise him. Ah! 